right now as um, in place of the chair of the all party parliamentary groups a uh, group for british six because Panji Preet Kaur Gill is on her feet voting in parliament and should be with us uh, within the next 15 minutes or so. Mira Nahe Majinder Pal Kaur, I'm the International Legal Director of United Six. And by way of introduction, may I can on the hand that um, when Gurmeet Kaur, the author of the book, The Valiant, um, just one Singhalra approached me and said that I have now written the book, the duty is yours to make sure the young uh, in the world know what just once in Calra did and to continue their work. And this was in the middle of COVID where everyone is um, not able to meet each other. I'm happy to tell you that uh, Preet Corgill has joined us now and uh, perhaps Preet, you want to take over from the welcoming uh, duties that you had assigned me whilst you were away um, and then I'll jump in again. Thank you so much, Manjinder Kaur. Vai Guruji ka Khalsa, Vai Guruji ki Fateh. Wonderful to see so many people um, on the call. Um, we will be joined by MPs and Thanmanjit Singh Desi has also joined us on this call. Um, can I just also say, I, I, we've literally been voting and we are due to have another vote at seven or after seven, at which point I am going to, prior to that, ask the co-chair to Manjinder Bhav Kaur. But I just want to say a few words, really, and just give you a brief introduction of today's event. Um, firstly, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Can I ask you to put your board? Can we mute? Can you mute? Okay, that's great. I think the host has managed to mute everybody, which is great. Um, I just want to say on behalf of the all party parliamentary group for British Sikhs, we are a cross party uh, group of MPs. Lord Ranbir Suri has also joined us. He is a member of our uh, APPG and officer. Um, and we are really honoured um, to be, um, you know, uh, hosting this memorial event on uh, just once in Kailara. Um, and, you know, the all party parliamentary groups takes up issues which are really important to the diaspora community. And of course, the very fact that we are still seeking justice in 1984 is something that diaspora community members here feel very strongly about. Um, and of course, we want to see the, the international recognition of 1984 as a genocide. And until recently, that hasn't really been the case. And there is a lot more work that we need to do in terms of the United Nations but also our respective countries in terms of that recognition of 1984 being classed as what it was, is um, a, gen a genocide. But you know, for me, um, many like me who watched just once in Kailara's very famous speech um, in Canada, I think, you know, it would have moved so many people and inspired so many people. And I was one of those um, young girls really that was inspired. It just so happens though, that when just once in Kailara was visiting Canada and the United Kingdom, I was actually in Delhi visiting the widow's colony. And I didn't know that at the time, that that's the time of his speech. And so when I was visiting those mothers in the widow's colony, it was 10 years after 84, the very message that they were giving to me and sharing with me, something that left me for a very long time and made me interested in human rights is that the world had forgotten them. And actually there was very few people in India at that time, human rights organizations, just once in Cairo was one of them, Fulka has been one of them, and many others that took on the plight and went to seek justice um, for so many of those families. And actually what just once in Kailara unearthed um, was just um, shocking. And I'm really pleased that people like Sadbal Singh Baines, who's also on this call that will be delivering the lecture, have actually taken on his work as, he, as has his family, his wife, his daughter, who's also joined us on this call, Nipka and Gore. We're very grateful um, to have you with us. Um, but the work that they have been doing and seeing them really at the forefront um, has been just so inspiring. And I know it will inspire future generations to come. I want all people to know about who Just Once in Kailara was. You know, there is still so much work that we need to be doing to educate our young children, um, our future generations, so they absolutely understand, you know, that the very fact that Sikhs haven't had the privilege of the freedom of religion or belief in their very home country in India. And I want to see freedom of religion and belief. Um, as, as the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Forbes, actually, um, it's something that I'm very, very passionate about as well as within my shadow brief. Um, and I'm really delighted that we've been joined by the um, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Ahmed Singh Shaheed um, on Forbes, um, who's joined us. So just very quickly reiterate um, that today, we're also going to see the launch of the book um, by, um, 
this is the wonderful book by Gurmeet Kaur, um, which I had delivered today and I haven't had a chance to read, but I'm, I'm really delighted. I've got books here for MPs that have joined this call um, so that they will get their own copy. Um, so really delighted that Gurmeet Kaur um, is going to speak to us and, and tell us about what inspired her to write the book. And then we've got Navgiran Gaur, who's joined us from California. She's just Kalra's daughter and she will deliver a vote of thanks. Uh, we've also been joined by Rajinder Singh, who lives in the UK, he's just once in Kailara's brother, so great welcome um, to him. And, and, and as I said, there are many MPs and Lords that will be joining us throughout this event. Of course, there is a vote in the House of Commons at the moment as well. Um, but I want to thank everybody that's watching um, this event through KTV satellite channel, YouTube channels of United Speaks, Kailas TV and Basics of Sikhi, and Facebook Live from Boss. And I want to thank the organisers especially Manjinder Balkor from United Speaks, uh, Boss, Seek PA, who's the media partner, and Cap Freedom of Conscious um, that has supported the event. Um, so I now want to hand over um, to my co-chair, Manjinder Balkor. She's a human rights lawyer, a former journalist who serves minorities and the underprivileged as the international legal director of United Speaks. She began work on a rural project called PASS, which is Punjab After School Study, which serves 2,000 government primary school students in 33 villages, and Manjinder Bal divides her time between Punjab, the UK, and Malaysia. So over to you, Manjinder Bal. Hanji Wai Guru, uh, I'm back here. I would like to say that I am where I am. There's a dog barking outside. So if I have to mute myself, it's for that reason. Um, so, as you have heard, that the Penji Preet Kaur Gil Day has no introduction to as to why we are here at this meeting. So, before I introduce you to our guest speaker, who is uh, Mr. Amit Shaheed of uh, the United Nations mandate as a special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief. Um, I would like to briefly tell you who he is. Um, what I liked about a statement he made in 2018 was when he said, national security is no excuse for limiting freedom of religion. Uh, that was a speech made at a time and st the time still continues where, uh, as we've seen in Austria uh, a day ago, uh, we've got elections in the US today. I don't know what the progress is. Uh, and various people are in a state of strife. We are also in a state of strife because of COVID. And whilst COVID is a health issue and not a security issue, they are interlinked because of all the unrest and difficulties communities are feeling with social distancing. So when Mr. Shaheed made that statement, and I had to quote him when I was uh, trying to bring the case of the Afghan six um, in, in the UN, in the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, I felt I had the best support because as the special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief, uh, Mr. Shaheed presents the findings of his uh, mandate to the general, uh, the, the United Nations General Assembly, uh, I believe at least once a year, if not twice. And uh, uh, Mr. Shaheed will no doubt tell us today about the report, which is now pending to be published to the United Nations uh, and the roles that he has played in making sure that we get a good idea of what are the issues around the globe when it comes to not only people who are in the minority and minority religions, but people who may be in the majority, but having a minority view about uh, the majority. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Shaheed, who is a politician from the Maldives, which is well known to most people because it's a beautiful country where people visit to feel good. Uh, today, I would like to introduce you a man who has been very robust about his role to bring the issues of religious freedom, religion and belief freedom uh, to the fore, uh, simply because usually when there is unrest, the first thing that happens is people of religion have to suddenly defend themselves because they are deemed to be people who have a view and have a belief and therefore 
uh, that might conflict with the prevailing conditions at the time of the conflict. Um, so, uh, Mr. Shahid, if we could ask you to look at the position in South Asia, where just once in Kalra worked for years and collated 25,000 uh, missing persons who later were presumed dead, and some of them, the families are still waiting, and this is, 20, uh, this is 36 years and more on. Um, what do we do with a, a, a people who are faced with such disappearances when they feel that they were put in that position because of their faith and their religion? And I like to make the I like you to make the connection that the strife that was experienced by the Sikh community in Punjab in the 80s and 90s was because of their desire to have their freedom of practicing their religion in Punjab, which was connected with the use of the language, the transmission of uh, Gurbani from the Sanctum Sanctorum, which is the golden temple known to all, um, and how that was the subject matter of a strife. And it is because of their determination of their wanting to have their uh, freedom to religion, freedom of religion, uh, that they were then targeted. And as we will hear from those who are going to be speaking about just once in Kalra from Satnam Singh bands, how young people particularly, and even sometimes children and wives and mothers uh, were picked up and never appeared again. And these are the disappearances we'll be talking about today. So Mr. Shahid, if we may uh, ask you to tell us, what do you think uh, the Sikh diaspora at this point, as well as the people in the Punjab uh, can do about the fact that until today, that we have not had the justice that was, that was supposed to be due to the families who have lost their loved ones for many, many years. I now put the uh, uh, duty to talk about it to you, Mr. Shahid, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, dear co-host, for that uh, uh, offer to me. I have very specific suggestions on that particular point. But before I come to that, I want to begin by stating what an honor it is for me to join the distinguished lineup of speakers today. And I think all of you are torchbearers in the best sense of the word. And it's a real privilege to be speaking to you uh, this, this evening. Um, it is really important that we also uh, use solemn occasions like this um, to honor the memory of, of Jaswant Singh Kara and of others like him who have done such sterling work uh, to ensure that rights of everyone are protected, that democracy is strengthened, and that the voiceless uh, don't go voiceless, that, that they are spoken up for by people who care. Um, I also want to spend a moment to pay tribute to his, to his memory, to honor his memory, to remember his work, and join all of you this, this, this afternoon are doing that. Um, as all of us know, uh, he was cruelly kidnapped in 1995 while he was investigating extrajudicial killings of Sikh activists in Punjab. His work um, was in instrumental in documenting vital evidence with regard to about 25,000 um, deaths of, of Sikhs at the hands of the authorities. And of course, seeking to end impunity for those atrocities is vital and he repeatedly petitioned Indian courts on behalf of the families and loved ones to get them uh, justice. And the, the key lesson we take away from his work is the importance of that, how that inspires other people and how that is so important uh, for those who have been denied justice despite the passage of years to keep on pursuing, pursue, pursuing that. The rights of the individual are belonging to an ethnic, religious or linguistic minority, such as member of the Sikh community in many places around the world are uh, enshrined international human rights framework with strong protections. Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, if you like the keystone uh, of the human rights framework, um, as well as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Persons belonging to national, ethnic, or religious minorities, one of the most detailed doc documents outlining what states must do to protect the rights of minorities, provide uh, these standards and guidance uh, for states in how they should respect, protect, and promote rights of minorities. Of course, there are also very strong protections woven through the entire rights framework on rights to equality and non-discrimination of all persons, which apply, of course, therefore, to minorities um, as well. In addition to promoting the right to respect, protect, and promote rights of minorities, states must ensure that minorities can take part in decision-making about not just, not just about their own life, but about the state they, they are, they're in, and of course, to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, and of course, use their language. And as you referred, uh, Co-Chair, that 
the Sikh community throughout the world has faced restrictions, including in, in the name of, if you like, security, uh, in, in the way they have, governments have intruded into, into core elements of Sikh identity as part of that process of, of, of pursuing, pursuing security. Um, of course, therefore, implementing these measures requires states to take clear uh, uh, legal provisions and, of course, policies uh, to support that. And linked to that, of course, is the is Article 18 of the ICCPR, which you referred to, the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion or belief of all persons, regardless of whether or not they are in a majority or are in a minority. And we see throughout the world that when states respect this right, with a, in the high level of respect for freedom of thought, conscience, and religion or belief, such communities thrive. They, they have much better, if you like, political, stability, economic, so economic prosperity, social, cultural uh, flourishing. And of course, each member of society, of society also feels safer and more empowered when there is strong respect for this right. By contrast, and as we see in many parts in South Asia at the moment, when there is suppression of these rights, they are accompanied by further strife, uh, further violence, more extremism, more inequality, and more despair and, and, and deprivation. So there's a clear reason, even from a pragmatic perspective, respect everyone's right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion or belief. Despite this clear message, which has been shown by empirical evidence, huge gap exists between respecting these standards uh, and, and aspirations for these. So as UN Special Rapporteur, I identify and respond to existing and emerging threats to freedom of general belief around the world, often with an acute focus on rights of persons belonging to these ethnic min minorities. You mentioned, uh, you referred to my, my upcoming reports, and I have two, if you like, on the drawing board. Um, one will be September next year, because this November, we will mark the 40th anniversary of the UN's declaration on the elimination of all forms of intolerance and of discrimination based on general belief. The most detailed document that exists in terms of what right state ought to protect for religious minorities. And I think for the Sikh community, there are key elements in this document that needs to be be uh, protected. And I, I call upon you to look at this document and to use it as a way to lobby uh, for your rights. I shall be doing a report on this one year, one year's time, look at how states have uh, respected this right. And in South Asia, and as well as neighbors to the East and, and West, the violations are rising. And I'd be very keen to hear from the Sikh community, the ways in which my mandate and my fellow reporters, right, uh, reporter on minority rights, reporter, reporter on uh, in, uh, uh, transfer justice can be helpful in upholding, upholding your rights. And one common, um, if you like, um, challenge we face in South Asia, and again, in many parts of the world, is impunity. Not only, not only are states directly violating rights of communities like the Sikh community, but also they are responsible for, for impunity when other actors uh, uh, ha harm them. And this toxic cycle spirals into, in, 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 into, more, in, in, into more violence. Uh, we see that um, in Punjab, uh, the thousands of extrajudicial killings that, that, um, that occurred many, many years ago um, still remain, if you like, unanswered to. And, and I think the impunity for perpetrators is one of the key, one of the key drivers of future, if, if you like, future violations uh, as well. So it's not just the Sikh community that face this challenge of impunity. Like I said, in South Asia, other minorities uh, face this. And even today in India, the situation hasn't really improved. And we see to India's or South Asia's west in Iran, what's going on uh, in Afghanistan as well. And to its east uh, can go up as far as China uh, and, and North Korea to see how these rights are being, being violated. So, so impunity and state repression um, are, are, if you like, um, challenges for all communities everywhere, especially when they, when they appear as minority communities. And of course, even when they're a majority, if a state is repressive, the state is intolerant, nobody escapes the, the if you like, the long arm of the, the repressive law uh, as it were. And as you referred to in the COVID-19 pandemic, everywhere minorities have been further targeted. It's, it's been a stress test, which has brought out the worst in most states. Again, society as well as governments are discriminating against minorities. The question is, what must we do or can we do? I want to remind everybody that last year, the UN adopted uh, August 22nd as International Day to commemorate victims of acts of violence based on religion or belief. The word victims, unfortunately, I like to call it survivors or torchbearers as we have been using, using this evening, but nonetheless, the, the word is victims. So the point I'm making is that 
these are data that we can all you know, use to highlight, if you like, those waiting justice for the violations of, of their rights. And I call upon Sikh community to work with me and others for next year's event to make sure that we make a, make a higher pitch uh, for, for justice for, of, for victims of violations of, of, of rights from years past. And what is required here for states is that they must focus on redress and remedy for those who've been, who's also been violated, including full restitution, rehabilitation, and guarantees of non-recurrence, which means stronger rule of law, and of course, building, building resilience in society. So these are big challenges, big demands, but we have to make sure states actually do live up to them. And to guide states on this, the UNO has, has declared basic, what's called basic principles and guidelines on the right to remedy and reparation of victims of gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of humanitarian, humanitarian law. Again, this, these principles stress the importance of restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction guarantees of non-repetition. So how do, we, how do we pursue? How do we make sure states do that? Of course, if states are in denial, if, if, if they refuse to acknowledge this, there are various UN mechanisms that can be resorted to to highlight these concerns. I have been and my colleagues have been raising concerns with various governments about violations of, of Sikh rights. And you would see that in the aftermath of the 9-11, so the secular damage is coming here. There, there, there's been a rise in attacks on Sikhs uh, on the mistaken notion that Sikhs look like Muslims are, are Muslims. So my current report, next report in March, looking at anti-Muslim hatred, will look at attacks on persons because they believe to be, to be Muslim, and which of course is often the Sikh community as well. And in terms of what do we do when states refuse to acknowledge their responsibility? Well, examples are there from, from, from other countries, Iran, uh, China. People have formed what are called people's tribunals. Obviously, genocide is something only, only a court can, I think, uh, uh, declare. Uh, the been case when parliaments have declared this, but I think it's authority that coming, or should come from courts. But people's tribunals have been very effective in documenting uh, violations and making the case that certain certain type of atrocities require certain types of, of categorization. This also requires guaranteeing space for civil society to fulfill its, its, its role in ensuring that there is space to do this to do this work. And the reason why I think it's so important for us to remember the work of people like you know torchbearers like just one seeing Kara survivors champions uh, of, of, of his work is that they do so at great risk to their own life. But when they do so, they make tremendous uh, uh, progress. They have made sure that people who've been, if you like, disappeared will not be forgotten. And it's so important for those who've been harmed that their memory is cherished, that they have solidarity, they have, that, they have, they're, that their survivors have solidarity and that we work with them. So as Jaswan Singh Kara once said, and I quote here, when darkness is trying to overwhelm truth with full, truth with full strength, then if nothing else, proud Punjab like a lamp is challenging this darkness. So I think, end of quotation, I think that challenging of darkness is so important that we all come together, stand up as torchbearers and light uh, and, and shed a light on that darkness to ensure that we can see what, what's going on. Today, I encourage you and, and join all of you to continue his noble legacy in shining light of truth on human rights violations whenever, wherever, and by whoever's hands they occur, thereby displaying the darkness for all and everyone. And I will conclude by wishing our American friends here uh, all the best in the next 24 hours and hoping that they'll be able to light a torch and dispel the darkness that have been creeping in some parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shaheed. Uh, wonderful to hear about the initiatives, especially for minorities around the world when it comes to freedom of uh, religion and belief. Um, we will have Mr. Shaheed around, I believe, uh, during question time, when your questions, which may have cropped up as you listen to him speak, uh, can be channeled to us. Uh, those of you who have, um, those of you who have uh, sent your questions in advance, um, your questions will also be considered. Um, Esvili, I would like to invite Satnam Singh Bands, who is, as they would say in the education field, a double MA, in this case, a double barrister, in the sense that he is a barrister in the UK as well as practicing as an advocate in, in India, based in Delhi. Satnam Singh has been a human rights advocate since the days I remember him as a lawyer and his wife, who's also a lawyer, have worked in the field of human rights not only in, in Punjab, but also in the UK and other countries around the world. 
Uh, Sutnam Singh Benz uh, is part of an organization called PDAP, which is the Punjab Documentation and Advocacy Project, um, and also an NGO called uh, Punjab Disappeared. Um, a topic which is so emotional, which has to be dealt with by a lawyer, must be the biggest challenge uh, Sutnam Singh Benz as a Sikh as well as a lawyer must face every day. And we look forward to hearing from him how has he taken the legacy of this, this one Singh Kalra? This one Singh Kalra hasn't just left us a legacy, he's left us a duty. Because uh, from reading uh, Gurmeet Kaur's book, where she clearly states that just one Singh was a completer, someone who believes that if he has started something, it must be finished. Because his life was taken in the way it was, uh, last week was the date that the courts have recognized that his life was taken on the 28th of October in 1995. And therefore he could not continue to complete his work. And therefore the duty lies on the shoulders of people like Satnam Singh Bans and everyone else in this room to ensure that the Swan Singh Kalra's work is completed. So now without further ado, uh, Vijay Satnam Singh Ji, would you take the stage and tell us what have you been doing that others need to know so that we are empowered to believe that it's all not gloom and doom when it comes to pursuing and dispelling the darkness of injustice. Vaheguruji ka khalsa, Vaheguruji ki fateh. First of all, I'd like uh, to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate in this event. Um, and also the, this event marks the the launching of uh, Gurmeet Kaur's book uh, on Just One Singh Kalara. Now, uh, I've had a chance to read the book uh, in parts. It was uh, delivered to me. I only managed to get it very recently, but um, I just wanted to congratulate her on writing a very sort of easy to follow narrative on what is otherwise uh, a quite a complex story of how uh, a man in Punjab stood up and exposed uh, to the world that there were these mass state crimes taking place in such a way that the crimes were being committed and then systematically being covered up. Um, so first of all, congratulations. And uh, I really hope that the book is a success in your other events and uh, it's something that really needed to be done. Before I go on to uh, describe the work that our organization has been doing. Um, I think it's, it's right to really focus uh, on who just one Singh Kalara was. And in fact, his name now is synonymous with the issue of the genocidal massacres, the enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings of thousands of Sikhs between 1984 and sadly 1995, uh, Mr. Kalara being the last victim of the very crimes that he was exposing. Truth is perhaps one of the most powerful weapons um, and Mr. Kalara understood and recognized that when truth is brought to light in the way that he exposed, um, it has a very powerful impact and what I mean by that is that we live in an age now where there is a lot of uh, focus on fake news and uh, I'm sorry, there's just a bit of uh, disturbance. One second. I'm sorry, there's just a bit of uh, repetition in the room. Uh, just one thing, colored up recognized that the only way in which these mass state crimes can be brought to the world's attention is through the collection and dissemination of data. Just once in color, 15 years before we had this phenomenon of WikiLeaks, and if you remember when Julian Assange's organization had uh, exposed how Western governments were resorting uh, to you know, a variety of uh, shocking uh, measures and tactics in uh, suppressing dissent uh, all the way up to extrajudicial killings uh, which were taking place in Afghanistan and other um, uh, conflict zones uh, post 9-11. Uh, and one of the most powerful things that came out of the whole WikiLeaks episode is how uh, data, um, when it's exposed in this way, 
uh, makes us aware as citizens what, what is taking place in the mountains of Tora Bora or in these far-flung deserts of uh, Iraq and in places like Yemen, where many of these uh, atrocities would never see the light of day. And I use that as a reference point when discussing just once in Khalilah's work, um, because Mr. Khalilah really exposed something which was an open secret uh, for the people of Punjab, but wasn't really uh, widely known outside of, of the confines of India. We, we didn't leave, live in a digitally savvy age uh, in the 80s and 90s. Social media, the internet, none of this existed. And uh, whatever was drip feeding out of Punjab, it was being disseminated in uh, Sikh places of worship, Gurdwaras, um, but it was largely confined there. And it was very difficult because of the Indian government's uh, insistence on not allowing uh, external observers or outside human rights organizations to go into Punjab and really understand what was taking place there. In any conflict where you have mass killings that take place, one inevitable consequence of a mass killing is that there are dead bodies. And one thing that uh, perhaps is, is quite a poignant reminder of this is uh, 25th it's the 25th anniversary of uh, just wanting Khalil's uh, disappearance and uh, extrajudicial killing, but it's also the 25th anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre that took place in the former Yugoslavia, where 8,000 Bosnian, Bosnian Muslims were slaughtered. And if we compare what's happened in Punjab to what's happened internationally with other conflict zones where the world's attention has been focused on these mass state crimes, um, various organizations uh, took it upon themselves after the conflict um, had subsided uh, to identify what had happened uh, to the remains of these uh, missing persons. And there's been a lot of efforts using modern DNA technologies to exhume bodies from these mass graves that were left uh, after the Srebrenica massacre in order to identify victims, but also to piece together um, this very complex narrative of what's happened to uh, these people that were executed in, in cold blood in uh, one of the most horrendous circumstances seen after the Second World War. Just one thing Khalilah understood that if the Punjab police were killing people, there must be something that they were doing to the dead bodies. And very ingeniously, when he started investigations, he discovered that depending on which part of Punjab you were from, if the police station was uh, close to a, a river or tributary, um, there was a practice of effectively uh, taking a dead body and the body would be thrown into a river and it would be weighed down. And in fact, some of the evidence that we uh, collated uh, was testimony from police officers who were engaged in this practice, in fact. Um, and we were told that there were various uh, methods and mechanisms uh, to ensure that the body uh, wouldn't resurface in the rivers. One example was that the bodies were uh, kept in these big, large uh, oil drums. And if they were kept in the oil drums before they were thrown into the rivers, the, the body would saturate with water. So it would make it easier um, for the, the body to sink. Other methods that were used, um, uh, 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 there's a an implement that the farming community in Punjab uses is called a gadasa. Uh, it's a sickle which is used to harvest wheat. Um, the abdomen would be uh, cut open and the intestines uh, would effectively come out. Uh, I'm sorry to be graphic, but this is uh, the reality of the, the topic that we're discussing. And, and again, the body would be weighed down with rocks and it was to ensure uh, that the, the body didn't surface. Um, in some cases it did. Uh, the body would flow to other states and in fact there are uh, newspaper reports of the state of Rajasthan, which borders Punjab, uh, that was complaining about the large number of bodies uh, which were uh, finding their way through uh, the Rajasthan rivers and tributaries, uh, having traveled a considerable distance from Punjab. But the biggest phenomena of body disposal in Punjab was mass cremation. The police would take bodies to municipal cremation grounds in Punjab and by just one thing, Kalala's work principally focused on uh, Pakti, Tarantaran, and Durgyana Manda, three municipal cremation grounds in Punjab, where the Punjab police would take the bodies and the bodies would be cremated as 
unclaimed and unidentified. Now, what that means is that if a body is found in any circumstances in India and the next of kin can't be identified, then it's the job of the municipal committee to ensure that the cremation is carried out. In order to carry out a cremation, you need to buy things like firewood uh, and cloth. In Punjab and indeed throughout India, the method of any uh, dead body uh, disposal, if they're from the Hindu, a Buddhist or Sikh community, is that a, a cremation is carried out. Uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews obviously uh, bury their dead. So the municipal corporation of uh, these various districts in Punjab maintain these registers of unclaimed, unidentified dead bodies. What just one thing Khaled I managed to figure out was that this was happening on a wide scale, that these weren't just isolated incidents of one or two dead bodies uh, turning up uh, in uh, these municipal cremation grounds. He in fact uncovered records which showed on any given day, there were dozens of, of dead bodies that were being brought because the entries in these cremation ground records showed that the unclaimed unidentified body was being brought by a particular police uh, station for cremation. And the interesting phenomena uh, that we certainly had uh, an opportunity to observe was that a lot of these records speak for themselves. So for example, um, in any uh, given city in India, there may be a very small, tiny proportion, I would say, of unclaimed, unidentified death. Uh, and what you would generally tend to find is that maybe if somebody was of a particular age or uh, an illness, um, their deaths would be recorded as unclaimed, unidentified. But what just one thing Kalala managed to uncover was that during uh, the late 80s and the, the height of these killings, in fact, took place between 1991 and 1993, when uh, the Indian government announced in Punjab uh, a counterinsurgency operation called Operation Raksha. Um, and it was in two phases. There was Operation Raksha 1 and Operation Raksha 2 which was resulting in a lot of these young men being uh, forcibly abducted from their homes, illegally detained in police custody, uh, tortured, and then either they died in custody or they were then killed in what were euphemistically described as encounter killings. So the police would claim that these persons who had in fact already been placed in their custody had been picked up um, from their homes. They weren't um, engaged in any kind of uh, militant activity at that time. They were taken, uh, tortured, severely interrogated, and if they didn't die in custody, they were taken out of police lockup, and then they were shot dead. The police would claim that these people were members of militant organization. They fired on them. They tried to fire back, and these so-called encounters took place uh, when uh, police convoys were fired on. Um, in fact, from the work that we've done in a number of these cases where police officers have faced trial, um, it's been categorically disproven that these uh, so-called encounters took place. Um, there are a number of features and hallmarks which show that none of the police officers who were engaged in these so-called encounters were ever injured. Their vehicles never had any bullet wounds, uh, sorry, bullet injuries. Um, the only person who died uh, in these exchanges was the victim. Uh, and if the police claimed that the person had been firing and they fired back, then the bodies, the injuries, the bullet injuries on the bodies were consistent with cold-blooded uh, execution style uh, killings. In some of the post-mortems that were carried out, um, they show that the person was executed at point blank range. Um, you know, a revolver would be uh, fired at the temple or in the body parts, uh, the upper chest, uh, which show that these were execution style killings from some of the postmortems and using sort of forensic, uh, you know, ballistic uh, uh, scientific evidence, it can be shown that the person may have been uh, in a crouched position uh, because of the, the position of the bullet. And we've tried to demonstrate this in courts uh, in India to show that these were uh, people who were effectively being detained and handcuffed, being executed in cold blood not in the way that the Punjab police had uh, described. So what did just one thing Kalala do when he uncovered? He managed to procure these records uh, way before India had introduced something called uh, the Right to Information Act, certain public authorities you can access information from. And uh, in, in India at that time, 
Uh, and that's not to say that it's particularly easy to uh, obtain uh, any type of information uh, as sensitive as this, but uh, there is a semblance of something uh, uh, similar to what we have in the UK, which is the Freedom of Information Act. He took this information and very bravely and very courageously at that time, and what we have to remember is that these killings, the spike of these killings, were between 1991, 92, 93. And it's 94 that just once in cholera really went public with his findings. So we're talking about two years after the peak of killings in Punjab, where these police officers occupied the higher echelons of the Punjab police. KPS Gill, who was the then director general of the Punjab police, the DGP, was still the DGP of the Punjab police at that time. It was only after uh, Mr. Kalara's abduction and disappearance and his wife filing this writ petition uh, that these things, uh, then he, uh, you know, he, 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 he either resigned or he was moved on from the post um, because of the outcry. But he challenged these people openly to say that he had direct, strong, tangible evidence to show that these people had been illegally abducted, taken into custody, killed in cold blood, their bodies hadn't been turned, re been returned to their loved ones. Even in some of the police reports, it clearly says who the person was, because according to the police version, that these people were militants. Their names were given, their villages were given, the post-mortems even described their caste, their age, all of this sort of plethora of evidence and information was, so he posed a single question. Well, how was it that these people who were in the custody of the police, whose identities were known, were cremated as unclaimed and un unidentified uh, dead bodies? And the obvious answer to that was because uh, they had been liquidated and uh, eliminated in these uh, ruthless uh, extrajudicial killings. I just once in Kalara was threatened openly, and uh, the book talks about this, and Gurmeet Kaur has covered this, that he was told that his public uh, estimation of killings, that there were 25,000, um, the response by uh, SSP Ajit Singh Sundal, who was one of the most prolific killers in Amritsar and Tarantaran at the time was, that just once in Kalara had got his figures wrong. In fact, it was 25,001. And that was an oblique threat to just one thing, Kalara. It was a chilling threat, in fact, that the 2001 victim was uh, just one thing, Kalara himself. Now, there was a period of about two months where just one thing, Kalara was openly challenging the Punjab police in the Punjab media. He bravely went abroad, and there were many human rights organizations, WSO and others. He traveled to the UK and uh, to Canada, and uh, they effectively pleaded with him to say that, look, if you go back, um, your life is in uh, considerable danger. Understanding the consequences and the magnitude of the disclosures that he was making, and the fact that this went right to the top of the tree, as I said, the higher echelons of the Punjab police, um, he bravely went back. And as we know, sadly, in August 1995, he was abducted from his house. His wife, Paranjit Kaur Kalara, is one of the most uh, phenomenal uh, people that you could ever hope to meet. And I've had the privilege of meeting and working with. Um, she fought a relentless campaign and battle, not just for her husband's disappearance, but she carried the torch of his work that languished and lingered uh, for a period of 17 years uh, before the Supreme Court of India and the National Human Rights Commission, which frankly, um, you know, it's a topic that requires many, many hours of analysis and deliberation, but I can summarize it in this way. Uh, 1,527 people uh, were identified from these illegal cremations. Barely 1% of those cases were investigated by India's premier investigation agency, uh, the, C, uh, the CBI, which is the Central Bureau of Investigation. Those trials have been lingering for a period of 25 years. Um, when we became involved in these cases uh, about eight years ago, we petitioned uh, the High Court to say that these cases have been stayed and stalled under frankly ridiculous uh, game playing 
uh, by the defendant's lawyers and these trials should proceed. Um, and four of those trials uh, had the stays vacated. And I'm happy to say um, that in those cases, uh, all of them resulted in convictions of Punjab police officers. So these took place between 2018 and last year. There are another 44 cases, but these cases uh, represent the tip of the iceberg. But one thing that was important to bring out in these cases is these judgments, um, which have taken place in uh, the CBI Special Court, show that there was a clear nexus because the judgments now prove uh, the thesis, the hypothesis, um, the submission of just once in Kalara, that mass illegal cremations were the result of extrajudicial killings, and that has now been overwhelmingly proved. And in fact, it's uh, Baramjit Gaur Kalara's relentless battle to see the officers convicted in her husband's abduction that went from the trial court to the high court uh, to the Supreme Court of India. And again, um, it's because of her tenacity and her determination to see that those officers were convicted that led to uh, those police officers being convicted and uh, those convictions being upheld in the High Court and the Supreme Court of India. And if you look at those judgments, it's clear now because those judgments in and in of themselves uh, say that the reason why Jaswant Singh Kalara had been a target of the Punjab police was because of his human rights activism and the things that he'd brought to light. So um, from um, a, a historical perspective, as well as redressing the victim balance, what you have to remember is that minorities and those who, who are in much smaller numbers often face an overwhelming task to say that the prevailing state narrative that there was terrorism in Punjab and human rights violations didn't take place or they've been wildly exaggerated by human rights groups, it's almost impossible sometimes to credibly, scientifically, empirically, and through the collection of data, counter that narrative because of the circumstances and situation that human rights activists and groups have to operate. So the fact that these judgments, even after a period of 25 years, have now categorically determined that these things have happened, it's opened up a gateway. And that's the gateway um, that we wanted to find ourselves in, that if in 44 cases, charge sheets have been filed, if of those 44 cases, five cases have resulted in convictions, then over a period of 10 years, we collated a further 8,257 victims across Punjab. And our you know, sort of call for justice in this case is to really reiterate what uh, just once in Kalara had uh, argued for uh, 25 years ago, that there needs to be an independent, credible commission of inquiry of all enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, and uh, instances of torture of victims and their families between 1984 and 1995. So by securing these uh, small piecemeal victories, um, it's strengthened that resolve, it's proved um, that the narrative that was well known by human rights activists and those who've had to operate in this uh, field, that Punjab, in order to move forward, needs to grapple, it needs to grip what took place in Punjab. And India, uh, the size of the country it is and where it occupies itself in the world stage, cannot simply ignore what had taken place in Punjab uh, during that decade of darkness, frankly. If the evidence is there, uh, which it is, we filed voluminous volumes of cremation records, of police first information reports, of post-mortems, in a public interest litigation that we initially filed in the Supreme Court of India um, the year before last. Uh, the Supreme Court of India told us uh, to take up the, the public interest litigation in the Punjab and Haryana High Court, which we did. And this was before the pandemic. And our case was filed, uh, uh, writ petition 270 of 219. And it poses these questions. Um, uh, and in fact, when we filed this case, one of the lawyers remarked that the whole purpose of a PIL is to prompt the court to investigate, not to present the evidence before an investigation has taken place. But it's the experience of the Sikh community and all of those who have suffered in Punjab 
that even where they have credible allegations, they were never taken seriously. So we actually had to work backwards. We had to prove a case. We had to go much further than, you know, a victim recording a testimony to say that these were the circumstances in which uh, our loved one was picked up. And this is how uh, they had been uh, tortured. We'd seen them in custody. We had to show that there were cremation records that show that there is um, a, a, a date that coincides with the abduction by the same police, which showed there was an, un, uh, an illegal, unclaimed, unidentified cremation. There's a post-mortem which shows that the existence of these gunshot wounds is more consistent with an extrajudicial killing. And we've said that for a tiny organisations such as ours um, we can't do this job. It requires a committed, sincere commission of inquiry, but there is enough evidence that we've presented to uh, the Punjab and Haryana High Court to take these uh, steps. So one thing that we've hopefully firmly cemented is that this is an issue that's not going to go away. It can't disappear. Legally, it's impossible. Um, because there is a huge volume of evidence which shows what's happened to these missing persons. There are requirements both under Indian domestic law as well as international law that say, let's just take it from a very, you know, sort of at the end of what, what our litigation is, that there's a dead body. Even the Geneva Convention says that in times of war, there is a duty on two uh, states who are engaged in an armed conflict to return the body of enemy combatants. The body can't be defiled, the body can't be uh, abused in any way, and if it can't be returned to the neighbouring country, if there is any attempt to may, made to uh, cremate or bury the body, it has to be done uh, with respect and dignity. And the question we've posed to the court in India is this, that these weren't em enemy combatants, these weren't uh, people from Pakistan or Bangladesh or, or any country that India has uh, hostilities with. These were citizens of this very country. And the fact that their families and their heirs haven't even had a death certificate uh, means that none of their families can get uh, all of the sort of uh, entitlements that they're entitled to, things like um, a widow's pension for uh, the widow, uh, the children get subsidies in school uh, if they can prove that their father is uh, no longer there. The fact that these people are in a, a limbo, in a no man's land, because they are simply known as disappeared persons and they can't prove one way or the other whether they're dead or alive is frankly unacceptable. So these are some of the issues that we've uh, now petitioned. And again, it's a, a reiteration of what uh, Jaswan Singh Kalla had asked in, in 95, that at the very basic uh, human level, when a person is born, when a child is born, it is entitled to a birth certificate. When a person dies, their heirs, their next of kin, their loved ones are entitled to a death certificate. These are the, the only two certificates that really prove the existence uh, of a human being. So much uh, is placed upon these. So if these people were born in a country, how can it be that they are enforced to disappear? Um, it's completely unacceptable state of affairs. So just to sort of, uh, you know, come to a, a conclusion on this, um, I'm all in favour of uh, memorialising uh, certain events. But what I would certainly say is that the Jaswan Singh Kalara story uh, has not come to uh, an end by any means. And in fact, the tragedy of what's taken place in Punjab has not come to an end uh, by any stretch of the imagination at all. Um, there, is, there are various uh, bodies and organizations. Uh, the UN has an affiliate organization called the International Commission on Missing Persons. Um, they have done various projects uh, to identify victims of Nazi persecution. There were exhumations of graves in Norway. Um, Spain in 2018 set up a commission uh, on uh, war crimes that were committed uh, by Franco, the Franco regime. In Colombia, in, uh, in Cambodia, there is a UN war crimes uh, tribunal uh, that recently convicted uh, a member of Pol Pot's regime for offences that took place back in 1979. 
In the UK, there is precedent, a very important precedent that was set in the case of Swanyuk, uh, where in 2000, uh, a Nazi concentration camp guard uh, was convicted uh, for offences that took place in 1944. And evidence, uh, victims of uh, the Nazi Holocaust um, deposed uh, before an English court. So anyone who says, well, these are old issues, the passage of time means uh, that you can't bring prosecutions, there shouldn't be commissions of inquiry, um, are not in keeping with uh, international jurisprudence. And in fact, the Supreme Court of India, in the case of Manipur, where there were a, a large number of extra, extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearance that took place uh, between uh, the late 70s and 2012, uh, set up a commission. So we latched our arguments um, in, a, in a similar fashion to say, even under Indian uh, constitutional uh, standards, you've done this for the people of Manipur. Uh, in Gujarat, where there was a spate of fake encounter cases, uh, you set up a, 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 a commission of inquiry. In Bombay, in the late 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, there was a phenomena of uh, the Bombay police uh, liquidating people in fake encounters then why is it that the largest number of recorded extrajudicial killings that has taken place throughout the whole of India has not seen a single commission of inquiry? It's unsustainable. So what I would like to sort of really bring uh, to uh, everyone's attention is that these are issues that are not going to be resolved within a day, a week or a year. At the moment, our teams are still working on the ground in Punjab, uh, despite COVID, despite the pandemic, uh, despite the courts being closed, uh, despite uh, both the Punjab and Haryana High Court and the Supreme Court saying that they're only taking up urgent matters. It makes all of this even more challenging. Um, but one thing I will uh, uh, really reiterate is the struggle for justice um, has to be kept alive. Whether we get the results that we would like to see or not, that is really uh, secondary. Uh, the fact that these witnesses, some of whom are in their late 80s, some of whom are in their 90s, we've had uh, situations where we've had to arrange special ambulances or ask the judges to take the testimony at their bedside. It's to ensure that they're given their day in court so that they, they are given the opportunity to look their accusers in the eyes to say, you picked up my son, I can identify you even after 25 years. And this is how, after you had taken my son into custody, um, you abused me, you tortured me, and those scars that these people bear um, are still live. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to listen to any of these, uh, frankly, phenomenal and incredible uh, genocide survivors, uh, they're humbling. So um, uh, Benjamin Jindalbar was saying, what, what is it that we can do? We have to stand by each and every one of these victims. And uh, it's not even just about Punjab. If a stand isn't taken, um, then it could happen to any community in India at any time. And indeed in pockets, it already has. Um, if, if anyone says that after 1995, uh, extrajudicial killings, torture and enforced disappearances have just completely uh, disappeared from India, then you're sadly mistaken. In the last year, uh, just to bring you up to speed with what's going on, Amnesty International has been forced to leave. Uh, it's closed its uh, offices in India because of problems that it's faced with its human rights work. Uh, Bravina Angar, um, who is a Kashmiri uh, human rights activist, uh, a woman whose own son was enforced disappeared, and uh, has an organization in Kashmir in Shirinagar called the Association of Victims uh, Families that used to meet every Friday and campaign uh, for the disappeared in Kashmir. Her offices were raided last week. Um, Soni Suri, uh, another phenomenal female human rights activist who's, who's been uh, doing courageous work. She is one of the just once in Kalaras of India at the present time, a woman who was sexually abused in uh, police lockup, tortured severely, who speaks up on uh, behalf of Adivasi rights, um, has been crusading uh, for justice and accountability in places like Jatisgarh. Now, 
these groups, uh, groups in Manipur and other conflict uh, areas of, they haven't given up. And to see the determination, tenaciousness, uh, despite all of the problems and the threats that they face, um, again, it's humbling, it's inspiring, and it's what we should be doing uh, as a community to say that we owe it to all of those uh, minorities who are struggling uh, to pursue these cases. And then the time to write the history of this is maybe in 20 or 30 years time to say that it took uh, the Sikhs of Punjab 50 years to litigate these cases. There is something fundamentally wrong with the system of justice in India that has to change. It's unacceptable that people have to suffer um, in the way that they are. And, you know, I haven't even touched on the fact that witnesses are often um, intimidated. We've had to file numerous complaints where those police officers who are retired from the Punjab police, who still have access to uh, all of the resources within the Punjab police network to try and browbeat, to try and intimidate, uh, to try and coerce these family members not to come to court. And our job is uh, to stand completely shoulder to shoulder with them you know, be what the consequences may to ensure that they are given their hour, their two hours, their three hours in court to depose and um, to be, be able to do that freely. So um, I'll just conclude by saying this, um, that we shouldn't always measure these things by results. Um, just one thing, Kalada paid the ultimate price. He knew in his heart of hearts, if you speak to his family, he knew his destiny. And he knew the only way that this could be brought to the world's attention was that if he made such a huge sacrifice, which is what he did, um, he had to become the last victim of the very enforced disappearances that he was exposing in order for the world to see that this wasn't, this was so brazen that even when a human rights activist stood up and tried to hold the state to account, he himself in broad daylight was abducted, murdered, and then his body was thrown into the Harike River, which was just completely unacceptable, but shows you the level and volume of uh, these human rights violations that were taking uh, place in Punjab. So I'd just like to uh, again conclude by thanking uh, uh, Gurmeet Kaur Banji for a wonderful book. Please everybody uh, try and uh, buy it and uh, it will help you understand uh, more about his life and his background. And uh, please follow uh, the work that we're trying to do. Our website is Punjab Disappeared and uh, we'll hopefully keep everyone updated on a regular basis in terms of the litigation. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Vaheguru Ji Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Listening to Satnam Singh Ji talk about the work that has carried on since Jiswan Singh Kalara must give a lot of solace to the world and Jiswan Singh Kalara must be smiling that my work may not yet be complete but I've left behind lions and lionesses who continue to evade the, the, the hunter and continue his work. Um, I now have the opportunity to invite Navkiran Kaur, whose unique role today in today's meeting is to thank all of you. To thank you because the lamp that Jaswan Singh Kalra famously referred to in his speech in Canada, the little lamps continue to be lit only because every lamp decided to remain lit. So Navkiran Kaur, who now lives in California, who had gone to the US to pursue her studies, has lived in a family that's a family of um, Shaheeds, is the father, but before that, uh, her grand, his grandfather was part of the Gadar party, and how when in Hong Kong he never returned, um, the family uh, would not know what were the circumstances in which he lived as a activist of the Ghadar party. The family is also known to be living in the border of Pakistan in a place called Kalara, where uh, not only did the first guru visit, but that there is a history of uh, sacrifice and, and uh, strife being experienced for being a border village. Um, I now call upon Kiran Kaur to tell us how was it like um, to be the daughter of a father we're talking about today, who others have likened to be like uh, Martin Luther King, famous for his speech, a person who not only translated uh, his evidence into a speech, but then actually paid the price for doing so. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh, I call upon Navkiran Kaur. 
Vaigur Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaigur Ji Ki Fateh. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the participants and the panelists uh, who uh, made it to this event today. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Shaheed, uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Religion or, uh, or Belief. Uh, I would like to just uh, highlight like my father's last speech in Canada where he emphasized uh, how important uh, it is for the Sikhs to actually uh, go tell their story uh, about all the human rights abuses that uh, they have been facing, uh, not just to the legal courts, not just to the judicial courts, but to actually go to people's court, to go to the people's court worldwide. And I think this is uh, one of the opportunity uh, we as a Sikh in the entire community, uh, we should always seek for like wherever it is possible to connect to uh, uh, whichever organizations which can represent uh, the human rights uh, work that has been done and to tell our story, our narrative, and not what, what the government has been telling for, for a long time. Uh, thank you for sharing all the initiatives uh, that you uh, discussed today. And I hope, really hope that uh, the youth that has connected through uh, this event today would uh, actually uh, get to know these uh, uh, initiatives and actually get involved. Because I feel like this is more as a personal belief or uh, as a sick that whenever we identify ourselves as a Sikh, it's like our, it et ethically and morally becomes our duty to be the human rights defender. That's also part of one of uh, the thing that my father said in his speech that Khalsa was created to be the human rights defenders. And if we are not able to defend our own human rights, then we cannot define what Khalsa is. So wherever we in the world we are living in, uh, we definitely need to look around what's going on uh, today in this, this whole biased uh, societies uh, and we need to stand up, but we also do need to stand up for our own uh, rights that have been violated for almost three to four decades uh, by the current regime in India. Uh, I would like to thank uh, MP Preet Kaur Gill. I'm really uh, always inspired to see uh, women of color and especially now a Sikh woman uh, who has made it up all the way to the parliament. And uh, it's a responsibility when you are from a minority group uh, that it's not just you who reach there, uh, you also create a space for the future uh, like uh, the future minority groups to be on the table, to have the seat on the table and, and be there. So uh, thank you for, for being part of this, um, this uh, event for today. And then Majinder Pal Penji uh, for organizing everything. She has been in touch uh, for almost a few months now. And uh, I'm really uh, inspired by how she handles uh, everything, uh, managing all the, all the uh, logistics involved in organizing the event. Uh, Satnam Singh Viji, uh, we have been, uh, actually I, I met him very briefly, but. We have been in touch uh, through his work, uh, Punjab Disappeared. And recently uh, in the Cholera Week events, I came to know a lot about uh, what he and his wife, Jaswant Kaur, has, uh, Kaur has been doing. Uh, I, I think they are the true torch bearers. Uh, when Jaswant Singh Cholera mentioned that uh, the one lamp can challenge the darkness and seeing those, uh, seeing that one lamp, there would be multiple others coming out uh, from different uh, corners of the world. And and uh, PDAP, uh, Punjab disappeared and INSAF from uh, here based in US. There are multiple other organizations and multiple other uh, lawyers and activists who have been working on, on the Punjab cases and they have been doing a tremendous job. Uh, I know 25 years for uh, just one thing, Kalada's disappearance, and 36 years when uh, we we can just say that it all started, although it started way before that, uh, from 1984. Uh, I would say it is a long battle, but uh, normally we we if we see that to make a monumental change uh, that is positive change in the society, it sometimes takes the entire life. It takes generations to do that. And to have that kind of a commitment, to have a lifetime commitment to a cause, only that can uh, take that cause to a success. So uh, 
it's it's a it's a life of a uh, it's a life of an activist. I would say never uh, we cannot think or uh, take it as a project which we can finish in a year or a two year. It might take the entire life for us to do it. And I'm very thankful uh, for Satnamri ji uh, to to be that torchbearer and to to keep doing what he's doing. Uh, lastly, uh, Gurmeet Kaur Penji, uh, thank you for the uh, the book, the book that has been written on my father, the biography. Uh, I think uh, so far, whatever narrative, whatever stories we have heard uh, has been part of the uh, Indian narrative. And, and the other thing that I feel is uh, this book was uh, written by considering that how important it is to uh, educate the youth, the, the children uh, who are going to be the future torchbearers for any cause of the punk. And uh, from the uh, contemporary history of the six, uh, this is, I would say, first uh, initiative, which actually uh, is talking about the Sikh heroes. And this is how we want to uh, define our story. And this is how we want to define our history uh, to our future generations. So I, I really uh, congratulate her for, for being this uh, first uh, author uh, that could uh, bring out the history in such a easy way uh, in such a uh, easy to read and follow uh, sequences of the events where uh, she has written the story of Punjab through the prison, through the lenses, how just one thing Kalara moved around in it and how uh, things involved uh, uh, with with uh, with his life, how, how things were going on in Punjab. So thank you so much. Uh, then coming on to uh, uh, Manjidhar Pal Penji's uh, question, uh, being a daughter of Jiswan Singh Kalara, I would say uh, I was 10 years old when my father was abducted. And uh, I've known him more after his abduction, after his uh, uh, Shahidi, than uh, I remember him before, before that. And it was very early on uh, that uh, the way we were raised, uh, our grandfather, our mother, they, they kind of uh, raised us with this... Uh, pride or with this uh, responsibility that whatever we, uh, whatever our father has done uh, was more important than just living a normal life. Uh, so I think uh, it was just natural the way we just got into this whole struggle and the way, uh, and, and, and the people we interacted with, we were raised by activists uh, that, uh, that were not just from our family, but all over Punjab, even uh, international activists would come visit us. So that inspired us and that uh, kind of took us through this whole thing. Uh, today, uh, we have an organization, Colorado Mission organization. As soon as my father was abducted uh, in 1995, a few of his friends uh, and close associates and colleagues, they got together to form a, a small committee called Colorado Action Committee. The, the main intention of that committee was to uh, actually see uh, through what uh, Jaswan Singh Kalara was working on, uh, what were the cases he was working on, and to to do some action uh, activities on, on that those things. But in 1998, uh, when uh, Kuldeep Singh Bachra, the, the main eyewitness who, uh, who actually testified that uh, Jaswan Singh Kalara was uh, murdered on the night of uh, October 28th, uh, and that day, uh, Kalara Action Committee was changed to Kalara Mission Committee. And eventually in 2005, when the uh, trial court uh, convicted seven of the, uh, uh, the police officers, this committee was changed to Kalara Mission Organization. So as an organization, uh, this uh, Kalara Mission has been uh, working as a bridge between those families. I would not call them uh, victim families. We are all survivors because we have been fighting against this injustice uh, even till now. Uh, and uh, those families and the legal organizations, the lawyers, uh, the organizations like PDAP uh, and INSAF uh, who have been documenting in Punjab. And uh, I would say after my father's uh, abduction, uh, it's just Vaiguru's uh, Kirpa that uh, my mother was able to take up this whole case and my mother was able to uh, pursue the legal battle and the entire team of Kalara Mission organization who even till date have been committed. And uh, for, for us growing up uh, as a children, uh, I would say 
I uh, when I came to US, my mother sent me here saying that to Panth Diti hai, so Panth will take care of you. And I'm really uh, grateful to the Panth. Uh, as a family, uh, my brother, my mother, and myself, uh, we think that we have gotten tremendous moral support uh, from the Panth, and uh, there there are no regrets. And I would say uh, the the legacy of just one Singh Kalara lives through all the Sikhs. And as a Sikh, uh, it is our responsibility that wherever we live and however we live, uh, we have certain responsibilities. There are a lot of projects that we can uh, carry on uh, within Sikhi. Uh, and uh, and as, as Jiswan Singh Kalara uh, mentioned in his speech, that he is only uh, working on a one small project, uh, which is about human rights and which is uh, about those 25,000 disappeared um, uh, Sikhs who have been uh, uh, killed uh, extrajudicially, and he's here to talk about that report. And uh, being uh, part of Colorado Mission Organization and Colorado Family, I would say we we stay committed to that same project of the Pant. And I would uh, like that all the six, uh, especially the youth, uh, to pick your own projects uh, within the Pant. There are a lot of projects, but stick to it and give a lifelong commitment to it. Uh, it's not something, Sikhi is not a project you can do in a month or two months or a year. You have to give up give your lifelong commitment to things and there would be disappointments there would be uh in something where we'll go in chardi kala and sometimes there would be uh and the uh the trials that we have to go through uh in which we would have to uh but uh if you're true to the guru and if you're committed to your cause uh, you'll get through it uh, that's all I would like to say. And I'm um, once again, thank you so much uh, for all the organization, the British organization of six student, the United Six, uh, all party parliamentary group, uh, Sikh uh, Press Association and all other organizations who have uh, made this event uh, possible today and uh, given us the opportunity to get connected virtually. So uh, that's all from my side. Vaigurji ka khalsa, Vaigurji ki fateh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Navkiran Panji. Uh, Mr. Shaheed, we would like to invite you to stay two more minutes longer because the book that everyone's been talking about needs to be um, launched by you. Uh, this is the book called The Valiant Jaswan Singh Kalra, uh, written by Gurmeet Kaur. Uh, because of all the arrangements that couriers could not arrange, you did not get a copy of the book. Uh, and therefore, we invite Gurmeet Kaur to hold the book out from he, her uh, studio in, I believe she's in Atlanta right now, uh, whilst we ask you to launch the book. In particular, there is a phrase, uh, rather a paragraph perhaps or less, that uh, Paramji Kaur Khalra, the uh, wife of Jaswan Singh Khalra, has been quoted in her book. Uh, Panji Guru, do you have that text to hand? Because I couldn't get my fingers on it uh, myself. I'm not also in a place where the book was available. So if that's possible, otherwise, um, listening to everything we've heard between what Mr. Shaheed said, Satnam Singh has highlighted and Kiran Kaur has thanked us for, the important thing is on this uh, event, which had at one time 94 participants, uh, they have taken away with them a very beautiful uh, insight into what uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur could do into what Satnam Singh has done and continues to do and wants others to do so that the lamp that was lit, the lions and lionesses left behind continue to evade the hunter um, so that one day the hunter will be defeated. Um, so uh, Mr. Shaheed, with a few words, if you could launch the book. Uh, thank you very much. It's a real honor and privilege to launch this very important book, The Valiant, by Gurmit Kaur today about a very inspiring, inspiring personality from whom all of us should draw inspiration, courage, and of course, guidance the work we do. It will serve as, serve as a very fitting tribute. It's, it's a very quiet yet defiant statement, reminding his cruel abductor that they could take his body away, maybe his life, but not his spirit and not the light that he spoke about. And I think it's so important to keep reminding everybody of his valiant work, of his great work, 
younger generations to inspire them to do similar sort of work because the work goes on, it's, it's, a, it's a tall task. But also one of the most important things it, it does is to those Sikh communities back in Punjab, remind them or, or to, to tell them of, of the great work done and, of, and give them hope of what can come but also of those in diaspora community of the importance of energizing the consciousness about the identity of Sikhs, about the rights of, 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 this, of Sikh community and of the potential there is of working to, to have those rights delivered and then have this storytelling as a way to energize all of us. So I also want to thank and pay tribute to the author, Gamit Kaur, for undertaking this monumental task and for producing such a, such a fantastic book. I had a quick glance to it on a PDF version I look forward to quietly re reading it and giving it to my students as an example of what one can do and what one should try to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaheed. Mr. Shaheed, there are people waiting in the, in the meeting room to ask you a question or two. I really don't know whether we can prevail in you on that, but if just me, Riji, you are able to give the one question. Um, the okay. reason we invited you, Mr. Shaheed, is the community needs to have these connections with the United Nations. We are a nation without a state, but we are a state nevertheless for which, for which we have needs. And just read, do you have a question if you had to put, put uh, from the various questions that you had received that uh, Mr. Shahid put to him? Anji, firstly, Vaigriji ka khalsa, Vaigriji ki fateh. Thank you all for having me. It's an honor to be included in such an event and to be able to speak with such esteemed um, speakers today. Um, so uh, Mr. Ahmed Shahid, there's been actually various questions, so it's really hard to kind of narrow down what we can ask, but uh, I'll get straight to it. So an important one um, to ask is one which coincides with the timing of this week, which is a Sikh Genocide Awareness Week, where countless Sikhs around the world are remembering the period 36 years ago mm -hmm. when tens of thousands of Sikhs were victims of the, um, Sikh, the Indian state perpetrated Sikh genocide. You've mentioned before, and um, so did the speaker Satnam Singh, that the UN has prosecuted people before for war crimes. So a question from um, Rajinda Singh Sarai, what can we do, the Sikh community, to get, India, uh, to get Indian genocide perpetrators before an international criminal court? Okay, I'll take that one, but also can you add, add one more so I can give combined answers to, to two questions, if that's okay? Yeah, no problem. So um, another important question again coincides with the timing right now. So tomorrow is the third year will mark the third, the, tomorrow will mark the third year that um, a British Sikh, pol Sikh political prisoner has been imprisoned in India. So far, um, he hasn't been formally charged with anything. He's documented his torture at the hands of Punjab police and no evidence has been presented against him in court, allowing his defense an opportunity to defend him. That person is of course, Jiddar Singh Johal, um, the person behind the Free Juggy Now campaign. So in regards to his situation, what can the UN do, if anything at all, to speed up the process where he's being detained without even being charged and without any evidence being presented, presented against him in court? Great, thank you. In the second case, I wrote to the government of India along with a couple of other colleagues of mine um, late last year, raising serious concerns about his treatment, his detention, and of course, the situation that was, was, was there. So I think what we can do is follow up with, it, with a more public, more public, if you like, exchange on that because the last communication was a confidential one to the government directly, but then of course made public later on. So it goes off the radar almost. And then, of course, there was no reply from the government. So I think it's, it's good for us to take it up again in a more public fashion, perhaps. So there, there can be, I think, a more, if you like, public accounting for what was, what was what's happening to him. Certainly, awareness raising about his situation is something we can do and we will do. And uh, if you can give me more updates at the present time, it will help me uh, formulate uh, a response to that situation. With regard to you know, criminal accountability for what happened uh, in, in India, I think... Um, you know, we have to go step by step. Like I said, there are ways to build up the pressure, build up the awareness uh, uh, on the situation. India's response to my last report just a few weeks back was that we are the world's biggest democracy, as if that should, that should silence all criticism of, of anything. That may be the case, but then all governments have serious issues. And when there are serious issues, we must hold them to account. So 
first of all, there are lower level UN mechanisms that work a bit more, if you like, uh, quietly, like the working group on enforced disappearance, working group on detention, summer executions. All of these groups can be engaged to build up the case. From there on, you go one notch up to the, to the next level. It would be really difficult uh, to have a special mechanism at the UN set up for India, it's for the same reason as China would also be in the same situation, would block it, given India's, if you like, clout in, 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 in world politics. But that should not stop the mechanisms that are already there in building up pressure and building and, and they do something. So I would recommend you begin with the special procedures mandate holders um, and then just start building pressure from there uh, and, and see also if they can set up a people's tribunal, which can document, I mean, you have esteemed judges, retired judges or, or judges do, are doing this. So you have a proper legal process, but it's not a formal court, but creates the documentation and the case legal base necessary for further action. And of course, you know, if you look at the case of Iran or elsewhere, it takes years to get somewhere, but India is in Iran. Uh, I think the level of impunity India can sustain is more limited than what Iran, Iran is doing. So I think by building up more pressure through these means, you create a pressure for others to respond as well. You will notice that India is losing its world status as it were. If you look at the US Commission of Religious Freedom, whose report which came out in April this year, for the first time listed India as a country of concern for them, which means that people are taking notice of the kinds of violations that are, that are going on there. Of course, India is in Pakistan yet in this situation, but the kind of issues you face in India are, are, are becoming more and more. And I had this year, again, followed up on other issues of, of, of Sikh communities, re recording a pattern of violation against Sikh, Sikh, uh, Sikh minority in India, arbitrary detention, um, torture and, and custody, and of course, sp specific cases where there have been long running issues with the government of India. So I think systematically, methodically follow these uh, steps, and also at the same time, develop networks of solidarity with other communities because a number of other minority communities also raising same concern about impunity. Working together, we can create um, a, 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 you know, a stronger ripple that can become something more significant. So I would, I would advise going step by step and keeping forward and think about a people's tribunal that can really you know, create more attention on the issues that are involved here. Thank you very much for that question and also for giving me time. I have another commitment at my university, in fact, so I need to be leaving shortly. Thank you very much. So thank you for those answers. Majinder um, Palpanji, I'm not sure if we have the opportunity to perhaps uh, ask any questions of our previous speakers. I know we're running a bit over time or um, if not, then we can proceed. Yes, I was actually hoping that um, uh, Mr. Shahid would be able to hear from Gurmeet Kaur about why she chose to write the book. Um, I think Mr. Shahid has left, if I'm not correct. Um, at this juncture, I would think since the flow is in the book, uh, we will invite uh, Gurmeet Kaur to tell us why did she write this book? Uh, I know she's been missing in my social calendar, uh, she would say things like, Renji, I'm doing a very exciting project. Um, and I would think that, yes, it must be exciting, but didn't realize what she really was up to. She was beavering away uh, the amount of research that has gone into this book. Gurmeet Kaur is a software engineer in her previous uh, preoccupation with her life. Uh, today, not only is she a mother of two, but also a writer of books for more mothers uh, when she writes books for children. And this particular book, uh, The Valiant, uh, just once in color was written with a 12 year old and upwards in mind so that the issues which can be quite i wouldn't say dry but complex um, and sometimes get very academic and therefore do not appeal to the children like for example um, we had the case of uh, uh, you know martin luther king being known in history as a great speaker uh, panji has brought this into the fold of the younger generation so, Penji, without further ado, could you tell us why did you write this book? Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. So, first of all, thank you everyone to come together. Um, and uh, Penji Majinder Pal Kaur for taking me seriously when I said, I have done my job, now it's your job. Thank you so much. And, um, uh, and I'm in gratitude that this book allowed uh, all of us to come together on the same platform. 
So today it's November the 3rd, 2020. Exactly 36 years ago in the year 1984, I was a young girl of 15 years. I was surrounded by an angry mob who had set our home on fire. And I was desperately trying to escape with my parents and younger siblings in a city called Indore, located in the center of India, far away from Punjab. After the political assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, her party vowed a revenge with the blood of six in India. The state machinery set out to a carefully orchestrated plan, mobilized its volunteers to burn, loot, kill, and rape in every part of the country. Rest of the nation, except a few good Samaritans, joined their hands, no matter their political affiliation. After facing three days of terror, arson, and assault, we somehow escaped the hands of the mob, all five of us running in different directions. We had barely made it alive, but my three cousins were not so lucky. In the northern city of Kanpur, all of, all of them in their 20s were burnt alive in front of their widowed mother, one in front of his wife and a two-year-old daughter. Such was the case with thousands upon thousands of other six throughout every major city and town of the country. Their dead bodies were hauled away in garbage trucks and secretly disposed of. They did not even make the official figures of the programs that the media later reported as natural reaction of the nation upon the political assassination of their beloved prime minister by her sick bodyguards while propagating them as Delhi riots. For 36 years, my generation has been living with the oozing wounds of 1984 that will never heal. Yet, we did not have the heart to tell our tales to our children. How could we? The tales were too gory, too cruel for a child's heart. And for years, we were made to believe that somehow we ourselves were responsible for this carnage. There has not been one single book about 1984 that would have educated our children about the recent past. For years, I have been fearing what happens when my generation is gone, carrying our wounds alone without telling our children what really happened. That is why I wrote this book. Post-1984 and until the mid-1990s, disgruntled by the June and November genocide, Punjab entered a period of civil unrest in its quest for sovereignty. Backed by the government, the Punjab police and national security forces went on a killing spree to curb the insurgency. Along with the armed militants, the police also picked up their innocent families, neighbors, sometimes all the young men of the entire village they belong to, their aging mothers and their fathers, their wives and their sisters, unlawfully detaining them, torturing and killing them in faked encounters and secretly disposing of their bodies, just as they did in the June and the November pogroms of 1984. But this time, one man was determined and destined to end this business of secretly disposing of the dead and set out to unearth the enormity of the genocide by collecting the evidence of the crime in order to bring the truth to the world in order to stop it. He gave his life in search of the lost sons and daughters of Punjab, 25,000 of them. Hence his story is not his alone. It is that of all disappeared men and women of Punjab who were denied not only a right to live, but a right to their last rights, who were denied the right to be counted, whose stories we never told our children. It has been 25 years that Jaswan Singh's extrajudicial murder brought human, human rights abuses against sex to the light of the world. And in these 25 years, we have almost started to forget him. The work he had started is almost at standstill since a few efforts that you heard about. 
While an entire generation is gone, the eyewitnesses are dying off, the proofs are being destroyed, documents from the crematoria where the mass cremations took place are being sealed. After the genocide, the government is banking on the memory side of our people. But we won't let that happen, would we? We will pass on the story of the 20th century Punjab to our children. And that is why I wrote this book. Our children have grown up embracing and loving their neighbors, have learned from civil rights leaders and human rights defenders from around the world. They stand up for Black Lives Matter in the USA and the indigenous lives in Canada. They stand up for the violation of the Kashmiri rights and Dalit lives in India. Yet they don't know how badly they themselves have been wronged and that they need to stand up for their rights as well. They need to be inspired by their own heroes like Jaswan Singh, who spent his life standing up for others, the laborers, the peasants, the poor, the Hindus and the Muslims, when it came to standing up for his own, he did exactly that too. And with all his might, while teaching us that Khalsa was formed to defend the human rights of all. But if you cannot defend your own rights, you will not be able to define Khalsa to the world. So our children can learn from our own heroes about their own past and ch chalk out a plan for their future. That is why I wrote this book. But why did I write the book for children, you may ask? I believe that if we don't educate them through our stories when they are young, they will most likely shun the topic when they are older and be content in believing what they have been fed via the state-sponsored propaganda on the internet. I have seen this happen with my own generation, even in my own family who went through the same experiences that I did. Teaching history to the children provides them with a sense of identity. It improves their decision-making and judgment and shows them models of good and responsible citizenship. It also teaches them on how to learn from the mistakes of others. It helps them to understand change and development. History provides them a context from which to understand themselves and others. I refer to this Native American saying often, you don't know where you're going until you know where you're coming from. Without teaching them the 20th century history, how do we expect them to shape the 21st century? But since this book is for children, it has to be engaging and stimulating and be full of good moral examples for them to follow. And that is where our hero and his thinking at every phase of his life comes into play as a role model for our children to follow even when he was as little as the age group I wrote this book for. The book is structured so that the heartwarming story of our hero interweaves with the threads of the history of the 20th century Punjab that he lived and interacted with, including the events that led up to the 1984 genocide and post-1984 disappearances. The book goes a little back and takes the readers on an interesting journey on Kamagata Maru, the ship on which Jaswan Singh's grandfather, along with his 375, 76 Punjabi co-passengers, was denied entry into Canada in guise of exclusionary laws. The incidents that later led to the reforms in the country's immigration laws. It takes them to the Gadar movement initiated by the Punjabis for the independence of India from the British to which his grandfather dedicated the entire, his entire life. Through the price they paid for the Indian independence, the devastating 1947 partition of Punjab that took a million lives and was witnessed by his family being on the border of India and Pakistan, it takes the readers to the contribution and sacrifices of the Sikhs in the two Indo-Pak wars from just one's childhood and then into the Punjabi Suba movement that ended in 1966 with the truncation of Punjab yet again, when he was merely 14 years of age. It takes them through the national emergency of 1975 imposed by the dictator dictatorial regime of Indira Gandhi to the Anandpur Sahib resolution that sought the lost rights pertaining to the land and waters, the economy and the language of the people of Punjab 
along with the rights to practice the Sikh faith without interference. The asking of which painted them as a communal and an anti-national community. It discusses the, the, in details just one Singh's views on the resolution and the philosophy behind his views. It takes them through the provocation of 1978 that led the Sikhs to take up arms against the government to the massacres of 1984, leading up to the mass disappearances and illegal cremations until 1995, until Jaswan Singh's own disappearance. To make it attractive and interactive, the book is richly illustrated, heavily su supplemented with historical pictures and documents and newspaper clippings from around the world. So the words don't feel heavy and the youth lives the history feels it, imagines it, empathizes with it, and finally owns it. So that the youth from Punjab and outside of Punjab can't help but shoulder the responsibility for shaping our future. That is why I wrote this book. I wrote it in both Punjabi and English languages so our children in, our, in the diaspora and the ones in Punjab can understand, join hands and shape our future together. This is not only the story of Jaswan Singh, but also that of his father Kartar Singh, who lost his father to free the same country whose free government would then kill his son so cruelly. Ironically, both of Kartar Singh's fathers and the son's bodies didn't come home for the last rites. And Kartar Singh's story is the story of many thousand Punjabis losing a parent to 1947 and a child to 1984 and beyond. But this is also the story of our women, like Jaswan Singh Kalra's mother, Muktiar Kaur, who became the proverbial 25,000 and first woman or mother whose son was picked up by the police in broad daylight, tortured to death, his body disposed of while she awaited his return with eyes glued to doorsteps until her last breath. This is also the story of his wife, Paramjeet Kaur, who picked up the torch after her husband and best friend and walked a very long and hard road with two little children to fend for, not giving an inch in the face of threats, greed, manipulations, and personal grief. She fought not only to get justice for her husband's murder, but along with the families of, the, of close to 3,000 disappeared in the district of Amritsar, the ones that Jaswan Singh had uncovered in his investigations. This is also the story of hundreds of young and old Sikh women who were picked up, tortured, and killed the same way as their men counterparts. Those we have completely written off from our narratives. Those who suffered in isolation, shame, and grief, and yet gathered all they had and faced life head on. This is also the story of the daughters of our heroes, like Navkiran Kaur, who bravely carries the legacy to the next generation and helped me write this book. So our daughters can be inspired to see the struggle as their own and own up to the leadership of the people along with our sons. That is why I wrote this book. As I thank everyone who has helped create this piece of history, the first ever illustrated biography of this cadre written for our youth I ask each one of you present here to be a part of this milestone. I have brought to your lap, I have brought it to your lap, please take it on to all the young people you can. All the proceeds go back into making this book widely available. You can get more information or connect to this book uh, on our website, www.pipal.org. Our history, our struggle, our future, lies in your hands in these 225 pages. Please take the torch in your hands and pass it on. Thank you so much. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. You can see that Panji Gurmeet Kaur is an activist first and a writer next. Uh, she became a writer because of her activism. It is the teachings of the Sikh Guru. Then one, one must not only think about it, speak about it, but actually act on it. And she has acted on it. 
I would like her because it's an exciting book that very few people have their hands on. If you have a, a packet open, could you flick us through the pages because we would like to thank Inquisitive, your artist who illustrated the book um, and, and uh, which, which will be the point at which everyone will say that this is something that we should admire both artistically as uh, famously Rajwinder Singh, the Rajwinder Singh bands of um, Punjab had said that this is a work of art. So as you can see, uh, children will be able to relate to it. Um, I, despite my not having much time, went through a single sitting of reading this book up to page 100, um, after which I've not been able to return to it. And I will um, first thing tomorrow, I think, but really well illustrated. I would say if you wanted to sit your child down to tell them who his parents and grandparents were, this book will do it for you. Uh, at this point, we are in this position of awaiting to hear from Jaswan Singh Kalra's brother, Rajinder Singh. But to be fair to the trend of the uh, questions that have been going, and Satnam Singh is here to answer them with questions. Jaswir Riji, could you uh, preempt um, the uh, inter uh, intervening uh, talk from Rajinder Singh with some questions? Hanji, no problem. Um, are we looking to uh, address questions to all the previous speakers? Uh, I, I can't yes, uh, think you yes, can yes. me. Yes, if you could address Nam Singh's questions first, because then people will get the idea of what he had said uh, before we go into the generality of the questions. No problem. Just going through some of the questions that have been uh, asked towards us. Um, so, uh, firstly, I think I'll, I'll direct a question, and many have come in for um, Nav Kiran Banji. Um, so, from what you know from your family, um, what kind of person was just one thing, Kalra, and what was driving him in his efforts to do this work for the band? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think uh, I was very young. Uh, as I said, like there were a lot of activists who who used to visit our house, and one of uh, one of uh, my father's, uh, you can say mentor, uh, uh, Dalbir Singh Patarkar, He has been with Sant Janel Singh also during uh, his time when he was a journalist. Ona ne minu swal kita sega ki what do you think uh, ki tode papa ne uh, be bhot vada kam kita ya be jeda hai na vada issue hoya and then i was like uh, a teenager i was like ha bhi duniya jehdi ohna de kam nu sala rahi and it, it is a milestone right and he was like na he just did what a sikh should have done so jo ohna ne kita ek ek simple ji ek guru nanak padshah di jehdi philosophy hai ki babar nu jabar kehna ya ha da nara marna ek simple ji philosophy nu leke he worked and that's what he did and uh, it is anu like all 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 of us being six we need to introspect ki sanu eh hi cheezan baddiyan lagan lag gayan jo ek simple philosophy sade guru ne sanu ditti si then we need to work on it so i feel like what my father did was uh, true to his sikhi uh, uh, roots jo oh sikhi nu samajhde sige and uh, the legacy that our gurus had created for us and I think uh, all we should pray is Ardas Jedi Sanu Karni Chaidi ki we should also uh, be true to our Guru Jedi Sadi commitment Sade Sikhi Dinala Sade Guru Dinala. Thank you, Banji. Um, for Satnam Singh, uh, two questions that I'll um, throw at you. So, firstly, very simply, why is India not made to conform to international law when it comes to human rights? And to include with that, could you tell us the latest status of your work in bringing um, issues of the fake encounters massacres to court through people's tribunals and other? Okay, <clears throat> so just to deal with the first point, why doesn't India comply with international law? There are certain basic standards that every state should uh, adopt. And I'll just give you three examples. One is um, there's an international Convention Against Torture, CAP, which India uh, is a signatory to, but it hasn't ratified. Uh, the Convention Against Torture um, hasn't been ratified uh, into Indian domestic law. And the third important convention is the Convention Against Enforced Disappearances, which again, India hasn't uh, enshrined into its domestic legislation. 
most Indian laws uh, were put into place by the, the British. The Indian Penal Code uh, dates back to the 1800s. And if you look how these laws were used by the British, um, you know, we just to sort of take a tangential point, for example, um, offences of treason, waging war against the state, sedition, um, are the most widely misused laws in India. The Sikhs have uh, borne the brunt of those. Uh, they continue to, uh, as do many other marginalised groups and even political groups often find themselves on the receiving end of that. There needs to be a consensus and there needs to be a wider awakening that if you are a civilised state, if you are uh, the proclaimed world's largest democracy, then it's as simple and straightforward as this. You should have a law that prohibits and prosecutes torture. In all the cases that we've done, um, you can either prove a murder, an attempted murder, uh, or an abduction or a kidnapping, uh, but nowhere in the charge sheet is there a, uh, an offence of torture, um, even though the evidence is so obvious um, from victims that they were, were tortured. Similarly, um, the maximum penalty that can be given uh, for an offence of um, abduction with intent to murder, which is often the charge that's laid, um, it's the maximum is life, but often the judges award 10 years because there isn't an offence of an enforced disappearance. So the reality of the situation is this. Um, India can't be forced to ratify uh, and enshrine into domestic legislation. But if it's a country that wants to operate on the world stage, then as a very basic minimum, uh, the citizens of India are entitled not to be tortured, enforced disappeared, and any community. And, uh, you know, if you see the development of international law after 1947, it stems from the events of uh, Nazi Germany and the extermination of six million Jews. The world came together to say, that this should never happen again, the Holocaust shouldn't happen. And the irony for India is, in 1947, the UN came into being. In 1947, we saw one of the massive, uh, you know, sort of genocides of various communities, the one million people during partition. So whilst the world's focus was really on what was happening in Western Europe, everybody lost the ball. Uh, or took their eye off the ball, I should say, in terms of what was happening um, in that very troubled region of India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, you know, there's never been any discussion in India or Pakistan or Bangladesh to say these nations were born out of bloodshed and genocide and ethnic cleansing and all these terms that have now become sort of common in international criminal jurisprudence. Um, but the, the, re the reality is, unless there's enough pressure made both within India and internationally to say, give me one good compelling reason why a country shouldn't have a law that prohibits torture. There isn't any. Um, give me one compelling reasoned argument why a state should say that there is there shouldn't be a, a scope to uh, prosecute a crime as against humanity and if we take this further India isn't a member of the International Criminal Court and this is a discussion that I have with a lot of activists in India um, that there isn't anything to fear that if your human rights record um, isn't that bad or you haven't uh, asked your security uh, personnel uh, to engage in these acts, then why not join uh, or create an awareness within India uh, to say that um, to safeguard uh, minorities and to ensure that politicians don't engage in the kind of acts that were carried out in 84 and uh, in 2002 in Gujarat and very recently uh, during the last election. Um, th th that is a sort of uh, you know, it, it's a, a, a bulwark uh, against those sorts of things. So it requires, and it comes back to the point that I was making earlier, um, it may take many years to get to the position that you have to compel a state to follow this. And um, they want you to sort of sit back and say, well, it's hopeless, the Indians aren't going to do this. The only way you can do it is, you know, showing solidarity with the groups that are facing this at the moment, both in Punjab and outside of Punjab, but also... Uh, presenting uh, these compelling arguments to say that there isn't any excuse not to protect your own citizens. Um, and sorry, could you just repeat the second question? Um, 
Sorry, I can't hear. Sorry, I, I didn't Thank get... you, sorry. Yeah, I, I had to wait for somebody to unmute me. Um, yeah, the second question was, if you could update us on the status of your work in India and Punjab specifically right now with um, taking to court the issue of um, the fake encounters massacres. So we filed a public interest litigation of 8,257 victims across Punjab. Um, we filed that case last year and we've had two hearings on the case. The, the update from the last hearing was um, that the Chief Justice of the Punjab and Haryana High Court, who is presiding over the public interest bench, has asked the state of uh, Punjab, in fact, the Attorney General was asked, that all of these things that we presented um, in terms of what happened in the Jaswant Singh Kalara litigation, um, these are things that we say have now set a legal precedent that a body was cremated illegally. It means the person's entitled to have the uh, perpetrators investigated um, and criminal proceedings to take place against uh, the perpetrators. And they are entitled to compensation for the illegal killing and not for the body to not be returned. So we've given them a, a huge volume of uh, material. So the last effective hearing we had before the lockdown and in March India went into lockdown uh, was uh, a direction to the Attorney General uh, to provide the Punjab and Haryana High Court with those relevant orders from the, the Jaswan Singh Kalara case. Since March uh, we, we haven't had any significant process and uh, a, a lot of that is down to the fact that the courts are not listening or listing uh, a large number of cases. So they're, they're sort of operating in a skeletal way. Um, lower courts, where many of our trials are taking place, are not allowing witnesses to come to court. So, I mean, to some extent, it's a situation uh, that's, you know, affecting a lot of courts, uh, you know, internationally. Um, but what we are very guarded against is now any attempt to sort of delay or string out what is a very old case and there is an urgency uh, for this issue now to be litigated. So uh, the matter's now listed in December, I think it's the 12th of December that it's been listed for uh, and we'll have to see if that's an effective date or whether depending on what the lockdown situation is in uh, Punjab at that time whether we get another date uh, into next year. But what we must do is uh, what we're trying to do is raise awareness and to again maintain the pressure on um, uh, the courts to say that this is a, an important and live issue for the people of Punjab. Thank you, Viji. Um, do we have time for any more questions? Benji, yes, we can have you... one question. Just, Viji, can we have one question from Sutnam Singh, anyone who wants to know what it takes to live in India um, and manage his profession as at the same time manage his passion for what he's doing? I think that's a very good question. I think especially relevant concerning what we all know happened tragically to um, by just one seeing Kalada. So yeah, if you could answer, what is it like for you to do that work in India right now? Uh, I mean, look, it's challenging work. There's, there's no denying it's challenging, it's difficult. Um, sometimes it can be frustrating and soul destroying. Um, but I, I guess, you know, there, there is just that inspiration that we take. And uh, these families have been uh, struggling now for 25 years. And, um, you know, to stand with them and just to do, you know, whatever small uh, minuscule amount of uh, work that we can do um, is, is, I guess, what keeps us going. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant juggling act, um, you know, in terms of, what you've got to do with your professional practice and your commitment to this issue. But, um, you know, that comes with the territory. So um, there are many other uh, people that are involved, uh, Jagjit Singh advocate, Baljinder Singh, Jaswant Kaur. Um, we, we have a good team of uh, people that are all committed to this. So, um, you know, and Bibi Paramjit Kaur Kalara, who is our spiritual, um, you know, figurehead, I suppose you could say uh, now. And um, we've just got to keep it going. Thank you, Jake. Um, If I may just at this stage inquire if Rajinder Singh, uh, who is the brother of 
uh, just once in Kalra is still with us because we would love to hear from a person what it was like growing up with a person who went on to now chart the way forward for Sikh human rights. Uh, all of us as Sikhs are human rights activists, but when someone charts a path like he did, uh, there must be something genetic about it. There must be something um, to do with the family uh, that we can then nurture in our families to make sure it happens there. I'm waiting to hear about that. But in the interim, may I make some announcements on behalf of the organizers? First of all, I'd like to thank my co-organizers. Uh, that's British Organization of Sick Students, BOSS, very emphatically, uh, as well as Sick PA as our media partner. Um, but more importantly, all of you, Right now, at one time, there were 94 of you sitting to listen to what we had brought to you. Um, and as I'm going through some of the other messages, I find, and some of you may have experienced this in the last few days, that people have been, uh, uh, their pages have been um, blocked uh, by the likes of Facebook. I don't know about Insta being in the act. And you would recall how hashtag sick was banned uh, by Insta uh, in March and also Facebook. Uh, that this phenomenon, which we would have loved to, to point out to Shahid, uh, Mr. Shahid, which we will do after this meeting, uh, we would like all of you who are experiencing this, um, uh, we have Gurdwara's pages being uh, not able to publish, people like Gurunanak Gurdwara Smedic, people like the Gurunanak Darbar Gurdwara in Gravesend were facing difficulties. I don't know whether they still are. So it's like every Sikh is being asked to account for their history. They are being banned because they're writing about the Shahid Smagams that are going on this period of time and any reference to Shahids or certain names that are being picked up by the social media platforms are causing this banning of the pages. Um, I now wait to hear from Preet Panji. Um, I'm told that my headphones are giving try my natural voice. If this is any better, please do let me know. Uh, what we want to announce as a group is that what we started today was a method by which the PANT is updated by its activists. And we bring in subject specialists. And this is the first of the Jaswan Singh Kalra Memorial Lecture. And on behalf of United Six, and I hope my partners would agree, uh, we would like to continue this to be an annual event in about the same time of the year when Jaswan Singh Kalra uh, disappeared and then was killed. Uh, so that we might be able to tie it up with this period when in the month of December is Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib Ji's Shahidi. So we have a lot to talk about, but how every year we could have a different theme. This year, the theme was disappearances for the appropriate reason that it was just one Singh Ji's 25th anniversary. Uh, next year, it might still well be the farmers in stripe and there might be a subject specialist we would like to bring into so that the Panth gets updated about its work. Um, I need you to uh, be able to share the YouTube links to this video with anyone else who did not watch it. And if you think uh, you want to have others benefit from how you did, this is where uh, you can help. And um, I don't know if I we should, could wait any longer for Rajinder Singh because we are about 30 minutes over, over the time limit. And especially for Satnam Singh Ji, it is quite late in the morning, early in the morning for you. Um, if I get a cue from my colleagues, um, he's joining in two minutes. His link is not good. Um, and uh, the Bindajit Singh, if you're still online, would you be able to tell us um, how the Pant, which does a lot of good work, uh, it's not able to communicate its good work as a result of which we don't empower each other. With uh, Listening to Satnam Singh today, I'm sure tons of you feel, I wish I was there in Punjab doing this work. He actually went there. A lot of us aspire to be there. When we start listening to people who actually take the step uh, to go to these places where, as just once in Kalra did when he went home and take the risks that come with it, that's what Guru Sahib meant that I give no fear and receive no fear. Uh, so the Bindajit Singh, what do you think we could do to encourage um, such exchange of information within the Panth? 
my kutika kata, my kutiki fate. Benji, I wasn't expecting to talk, and so I hadn't even put my camera on. Um, I think when I, when I first heard, you know, everyone knows what just once in Kalda did. He he paid the ultimate sacrifice, and he knew it as well. But when he was abroad uh, in the UK, in Canada, he very much knew that his life was in danger. And so when Stram Singh and Jaswant Kaur, you know, went there, I remember Stram Singh saying six months originally, now it's well over a decade. And to carry on that work of individual lives that have been lost trying to get some form of justice in india i don't it's it's easy to say this in words i think many of us couldn't do it we have too many freedoms living abroad um and i think even now we're having this event with people across the globe and most of us live in countries where we still have freedoms yes we have our uh facebooks uh, closed off but we have lots of other freedoms and the thing i find with the story of just one thing calder which uh this book will clearly help but i think the masses i the wider public the non sikhs still have not heard the story of just one thing calder the wonderful work that uh, sthram singh and the legal team are doing there and it's it's how can we help in the diaspora but at the same time not jeopardize the work that they're doing i think it's such a fine line a tight rope uh and you know we're good at creating publicity i'll be the first one to admit that but this is an area where you have to bow to the wisdom of the lawyers and what they've been doing so i think that the battle goes on just one thing called the start of it and i think it's it's uh, behold on all of us to carry that struggle on in whichever way we can why could you call sa why could you give it why could you call sa why could you give it um i was hoping that preet kaur gill would introduce our next speaker uh but i would do that uh we have rajinder singh who has his surname as Uh, Sandu, I would rather call it a clan name, uh, but he also comes from Kalra, and he was the brother. He is the brother of just one Singh Kalra, and we ask him if he can recall to us what is it that he saw in him that then proved who he really was uh, when he went on and did his work. Uh, Preet, I would also like to ask you to, in, uh, to intervene at some point and tell us in the Europe, in the Houses of Parliament in the UK, what efforts. can be made so that this that we are doing through zoom could actually go into the 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 corridors of par in the house of uh, in the house of commons and the lords uh, so if we could have rajinder singh address the sangat to tell us i know you've been waiting very patiently and we thank you for that we had to change the order of speakers because mr shaheed had to leave um and and therefore we thank you for for being there but could you let us know what is it that you want us to take away about your brother vaigat ji ka khalsa vaigat ji ki fateh first of all uh, i want to thank everyone the hosts the people who actually contributed as a lecture or on just one's life and uh, on mostly i want to sort of say thank you very much to honorable pa- member of parliament preet ko gel and her insisting insisting that i shall come and say something and uh, i think uh, most of the work jaswant has done is have been or actually highlighted uh, i would like uh, like to only say about how he was when he was young what he used to think how he come to this conclusion or how he achieved it uh, i don't know if you know about village khalda the village khalda is surrounded by few villages which is like a uh, pahuvend like uh, sorsing like uh, shina bidichan like uh, wa uh, mari mari megas uh, the reason i'm saying is that if you go into the sikh history all the greatest martyrs of the sikhism 
were actually surrounding the village Kalda. The Kalda was right in the middle. So right from Baba Deep Singh Ji Shaheed, which is Pahuven, Baba Deep uh, Shina Bidi, uh, Bidi Chand Ji Shaheed, then uh, Subhag Singh, and all those uh, Pai Taru Singh Ji from Wa. And I think uh, we were very young, about maybe 10, 11, and he was two years younger than me. And I remember once he said, asked my father that why there's no Shaheed, why there's no martyr in Kalada. So when you look at that thinking right from the very early age, the question coming to his mind, why there's no martyr in Kalada? And my father very sort of politely replied that you can only become martyr if you do something for your panth or for the Sikhism or for the cause. Then only then you become a martyr. So there is no one actually have done anything like uh, constructive work like that. So he had all these thinking and thoughts right from the day one. And he was very determined. He never ever scared of anything. Uh, he will just do everything. And his sort of word was like, there's nothing which is unachievable. Uh, and so many other examples I can say, I can tell you, but it's not time at the moment. Uh, he said many things. He came to UK and I think uh, the international campaign started from UK when he came in here. Uh, he actually showed that the organizations in UK are not doing the work properly and they have nothing done in writing, putting in writing to the uh, uh, world organizations, to the governments. So he organized everything here. He organized to write letters to the uh, political uh, parties, to the head of the countries, to the UNO, to the Commonwealth. And that's, that's where actually we started all the work. I know it's very uh, easy or difficult work when you are doing something just in Punjab. That time to fight in Punjab was very, very difficult to even protect yourself. Uh, if we take examples of very other uh, martyrs, even the Jathedar Kaunke, who was very important person in uh, the Sikh history, no one could have protected because it was not become international matter. And the UK has played a big, big, big part in making this case a, as an international stage. And I think because the work been done in UK has protected the organization and his friends who were working on his behalf in Punjab. So I think uh, those things has uh, even in the future, if we want to protect someone or protect any movement or human rights, we have to work internationally. Because in India, in Punjab, you cannot protect yourself or you cannot protect the weakers. So I think uh, uh, I, I shouldn't carry on because it's not my stage to say so, so many things. Uh, I would just uh, say, give greetings to the organizers that well done. Uh, the book, uh, I haven't read it, but whatever is in there must be something positive. Even uh, the book is uh, one step forward, a right step that the uh, we, sh we must keep memories of all the martyrs, all the good work. And perhaps there will be another books coming soon uh, I think there is a, which I, I'm not sure, I haven't even read about that. There's another book coming, who, which is uh, written by uh, the Azmer Singh, who, who was a, who worked with Jaswant in his early age. So his friends contributed in, and that is their first hand information in that as well. Uh, so I think uh, it's nice to have one book released and then there will be another book and there will be a few more books. And I think all the truth, all the uh, family and every history will come out in the sort of open.
Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Rajinder Singh, on the point of books. Because we were expecting to be able to do a lot of events in the UK, but the COVID situation in the UK has gone in, into pear shape, if I may use that word. Um, I have, uh, United Six had ordered up to about 400 books, uh, which of course um, the speakers will get a complimentary copy from the Sangat because that's how we fund ourselves. And, and anyone else who wants to uh, avail the book, the book is available through Mighty Khalsa. I don't know the full website address but off, offhand, but I'm sure if you go to people.org, you'll be able to find it. And around the world, uh, people.org has listed the venues where the book can be acquired. But do get in touch with me as well, because I've now got 400 books and not many events to organize. Or if anybody wants to organize a book reading uh, where we could use these books, or any other event, let's defeat COVID uh, in the just once in cholera way by actually going out and taking the bull by its horn instead of sitting at home and saying that in self-isolation, we can't do much. Um, is Preet Gill available? Um, because I wanted her to round it off as a host and tell us what is it that she can bring from the Houses of Parliament in the UK uh, to this campaign not only this campaign, we now have a burning issue of sex being muzzled uh, in their social media platform voices. I always had the skepticism that we all you know, love to be liked on social media. One day somebody could just pull the plug and you suddenly forgotten how to even speak to the next person because you're so used to just doing it on sound bites on Twitter. <clears throat> but we are standing there. Uh, Preet, are you available? I am. Yeah, I just want to say um, I, I've had to turn my video off just because my link has been quite weak. Um, just to say thank you so much for a wonderful event. I know it's run over, but we've had some fantastic speakers and it's just been really inspiring to hear them and the Q&A. Uh, what I would say is, I mean, it's not going to come to surprise to anyone. I mean, of course, if you want change, you've got to be politically engaged and it's just not enough to have two Sikh MPs. I mean, it was great to see Avzal Khan also on this call. He's always been very supportive of the APPG events. There are lots of great MPs who represent huge Sikh constituencies. We have got to absolutely be engaging with our MPs because how on earth is it that we are going to get the recognition of 1984 being a genocide if we don't put pressure on our MPs to lobby in Parliament? Of course, we have a seat, you know, at the UK mission at the United Nations. That voice is really important. The government hasn't really Really use this voice um, to really build kind of pressure and to recognize uh, the plight of Sikhs. Um, and again, you know, the Kassan issue is another issue. Um, whilst that's impacting lots of places in the world, um, it's, it's absolutely, again, you know, it's denying um, the very people the rights of their own land. Um, and farmer suicides has been an ongoing issue. I mean, people shouldn't think that parliamentarians are not interested in these issues just because they're international. We are, all, the, all of these issues mean that we have links in, in, in our home country, back in India, we have family there. And, and it's absolutely right that we see um, this government that talks greatly about global Britain actually raising its voice and speaking on behalf of its diaspora. As a community, I think we've been, you know, to, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, we've always just been very satisfied with whatever we've had from any government or any, you know, system and process. And we should never, ever, um, if anything we learn from just once in color, it's about challenging the system. It's about speaking out. It's about having a strong voice. And so I, I urge everybody, you know, um, do reach out. And if, you, if you're struggling, then I would say go by your godware, call your MPs in and, and have those discussions, have those wider. I appreciate that language is a barrier. People don't always know how to contact uh, their elected representatives, but actually the Guru Gars know how to do it. And, and, and it's really important. We don't just give out votes. I say this into myself, you know, hold us to account. Um, make sure we are working for you because actually that's our role. We're there to serve our communities. So I just want to say thank you. Keep, um, you know, engage with the APPG. We want to bring events like this. You know, I, there's a huge amount of interest. Kalara has been a great inspiration to so many of us. Okay, on that note, uh, a lot of us are waking up to a new day and some of you are going to go to bed soon and some are missing your sleep. Um, I would say the battle has just begun is, is a phrase that we often use, but indeed it has. I'm going off to a meeting right now on Zoom. Uh, it's a closed meeting about how we're going to counter this muzzling and censorship of the sick voice just because you use the name of some shaheeds or refer to some campaigns, your places, your, your pages get um, banned. Um, so, so now I'm saying we might knock on your door, though I know you're very, very busy, 
but there has to be a legal response to this. There are rights out there, but we must go get them. On this note, uh, I thank my colleagues. Um, thank every one of you who stayed, especially the last 47. And uh, we will meet again. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa.